Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classics at columbusarts.com. This time on Broad and High. A unique swarm of blue butterflies has landed at the Franklin Park Conservatory. I think that's what I like, that somehow this butterfly symbol is very accessible. And a local dance project makes a global impact. There's a psychological phenomenon that happens in this hyper match cutting. If they're changing and they're exactly the same, it's because they're equal. And so that's really what I wanted the message of this thing to be. This and more, right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Audrey Hassan, your host for Rod and High, the ultimate intersection of arts and culture, where we explore the character and creativity not only in Columbus, but across the country. 2014 marks the 20th anniversary of the popular Blooms and Butterflies exhibit at the Franklin Park Conservatory. To complement the colorful and exotic butterflies that live in the indoor garden, Indiana-based artist Tasha Lewis has added her own fabric versions. Her swarms of magnetic blue butterflies seemingly blurs the connection between the natural and artificial worlds. Take a look. Right now we're celebrating our 20th anniversary of Blooms and Butterflies, and for about the last 10 years or so we've tried to incorporate art into our exhibitions, and her work just really captured the butterflies, obviously. <laughs> For this show, it's mostly showcasing my cyanotype prints. I think a lot of people, this process, because it's a historic process, it's kind of this enigma. People are like, did you paint those? Like, how did you do that? Like, did you really sew them? Did you use a machine? And it's like, so it's kind of fun for me to both have people look at it and just be thinking and guessing about how I made it, and then other people who actually know the process, knowing then that history that enriches the piece. I started as a photographer and I was always doing darkroom photography and I was always interested in like creating a more tactile image, like um, an image that's less instantaneous. It's actually a photographic image on the fabric and um, the fabric has the chemical on it. I place my negative on top of that, put it in the sunlight, expose it for about 15 minutes, take it out in water, wash it, and then this is the end result, is a blue and white image. After I cut out each individual butterfly, I then stiffen each individual butterfly. And then it has the sort of quality that it has now where you can see that they can be you know, opened up or folded and they have a kind of body to the wing. And, um, and then I go through and hand sew magnets onto the back. I was trying to subvert the idea of taxidermy. I was trying to create these scientific specimens in a way that were more liberated, that were more free and um, that could engage the space in a very different way than, you know, something that's hung on the wall, like a, a deer head or something. Um, and these butterflies, obviously, they're the opposite of a cabinet of butterflies that you would see in a museum that's, you know, very geometric and very, you know, behind glass. And so these are, you know, trying to be dynamic and breaking out. People love butterflies. <laughs> it's crazy. I think that's what I like, that somehow this butterfly symbol is very accessible this birth and regrowth and, you know, the cycle of life, and then also they're just like this beautiful object. And then I just kind of ran with it and just kept multiplying and multiplying and just seeing how big I could get it, and, and this is 4,002 butterflies. <laughs> um, I'm starting a project called Swarm the World, and, um, and the plan is for me to subdivide this whole swarm into mini swarms of 400 butterflies, which is still a lot of butterflies. And, um, and so I have people in like 60 different countries so far. And the idea is I'll send out these 400 butterflies to the first 15 different locations. And, um, and then those people will have them for four weeks. They'll be able to install them in their neighborhoods and um, photograph them, upload them to my blog. And um, it'll be this kind of collaborative, social media powered, you know, connection of people through the butterflies. So my hope is that, you know, it'll go all around the world and I'll get all these new images and um, the butterflies will come back to New York and I'll have a big sort of final exhibition with all the photos, you know, taken by my collaborators with me and 
that's the hope. So we'll see. <laughs> for people to come in and interact with the physical objects and then see the more conceptual side of the project. Um, I hope that that like, you know, sparks interest and makes them think, you know, these are more about thinking about your, the objects you pass on the street and like thinking about them slightly differently as, you know, kind of these objects that can become beautiful. You can see Tasha's swarm of blue butterflies at the Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens through September 21st. And the live butterflies will be flying freely through September 28th. Visit fpconservatory.org for more details. What do you get when you team up an OSU filmmaker and an award-winning choreographer? A three-minute international dance film with footage from 54 filmmakers in 23 countries spread among all seven continents. We spoke with the duo that coordinated this ambitious project, which takes viewers on a journey of dance across the world. I've been exploring a, a technique that we could call hypermatch cutting, where every edit perfectly aligns in position and continuity with the previous edit. Um, for this one, I wanted to have more of a global reach where, uh, to get filmmakers involved all around the world. I really counted on Mitchell to give me guidance of uh, too many turns or what's that balance there or maybe simplify the arms and things like that so that we ended up with uh, a piece of choreography that um, a very experienced dancer uh, learned as the model for the project but then again 50 odd other people or more across the world uh, also learned parts of it. So. Challenge number one, getting the people. That took months. Uh, every day I'd check the website and go, ooh, one more person signed up, but it took a while. And I was originally hoping to get 100 people, and we got 54, but the filmmakers volunteered to do two phrases. So that was fine. <laughs> when the very first footage came in, it was from Turkey, and I go, oh my god completely oh. is not understanding what I'm talking about. But then additional footage came uh -huh. in, and it did work. And there's a lot of creative editing and a tweaking of, of the speed in, the, in, in Final Cut to get dancers to be a little slower, a little faster. Even though I had this 12-page manual online describing... And it was really 12 pages. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly where do you put the, the performer, what kind of location should you shoot in, what kind of camera should you use, what angle should it be at, all of these things. The bulk of footage that would come in was off for one reason or another. Hello, Mitchell Rose here with a training video on how to position the dancers in the frame. All the footage that everyone is going to shoot has to line up perfectly in editing. And that means the dancer has to be positioned with three parameters. Vertical placement, horizontal placement, and size. For vertical placement, if you divided your frame in thirds, the dancer's knees would always be at the bottom third mark, and their chest would be at center height. And remember that your camera is shooting at your hip height. I also want to give a shout out to Ellie Escosa Carta, who is an Ohio State um, MFA graduate uh, in the dance department, who learned the choreography and then was the, the model on the screen. Because without Ellie, there was no dance. Yeah, she was with us the whole, the whole, yeah. the whole way. So, um, so that the, the both the filmmakers and their the people had someone to look at who was right. demonstrating the dance. Right. And so Ellie was essential to the project. I have to say that when, my, when I saw the first um, uh, kind of draft of the whole thing, my comment was like, I love people, because there's something so <laughs> warming about looking at all of this range of people just doing 
steps together. This is something that's shareable. It's not something that is only personal for one point of view or one perspective, but there is something basic that says anybody can, can take part. One reason I just like making dance films is because uh, it's one way of just getting dance out to people. They don't have to come to the theater, we go to them. So, um, but I've done a lot of different kinds of dances, dramatic and conceptual and going for beautiful, but I've never done joyous. And that's what I really wanted to accomplish mm -hmm. in this film, was mm -hmm. just really just a sense of joy. And there's a psychological uh, phenomenon that happens in this hyper match cutting when uh, when all of a sudden somebody takes the place the same continuity mm. of the previous person it says these things are equal if they're changing and they're exactly the same it's because they're equal and so that's really what I wanted the message of this thing to be was that is that the people mm. of the world are equal Watch the full version of Globetrot online at Mitchell Rose's YouTube channel. Derek Gill considers himself an interdisciplinary artist, but he makes clear that he doesn't dabble. His formal training is evident, whether through his illustrations in oil paintings or kinetic sculptures and custom furniture pieces. He's the artist behind the popular series of Toeheads, which line the walls of the eating space at Kosai. We met up with him at the Columbus Idea Foundry, where he works on his large-scale projects. My classification is interdisciplinary artist. That essentially means I'm specialized in a bunch of different disciplines. Um, inter means mutual. So I cross a bunch of different boundaries, not just within the arts, but science and um, linguistics. And I bring all that to the table to um, make all the different bodies of work. Growing up, I was uh, in a lot of different areas. Um, like most artists, I was kind of hyperactive in a certain uh, respect. So I was always interested in doing a bunch of different things. I didn't know there was a term for it until I was an adult. That doesn't mean that I dabble in anything. I don't dabble. I kind of laser focus in one area and another area and another area. Um, so when I went to art school, I started focusing in painting and in sculptures and ceramics and printmaking, but I also liked writing and I studied science a lot. So I was kind of innately doing that. Um, when I found out there was a whole movement of artwork like that or career choices that were termed in interdisciplinary, well, I knew that was me right away. So I kind of accidentally fell into it. So at the moment, I have uh, quite a bit of different bodies of work. I've got a line of illustrations that are pretty familiar around here called the Toe Heads and their um, sister company, the Snack Hacks. Uh, those are fun, whimsical illustrations. I have oil paintings on reclaimed lumber. Those are called the Absolute Series. I have a line of electronics and robotics kinetic sculptures and metal work and furniture that I've built that are custom pieces of furniture. So the toe head started out being a drawing for a table for a client um, that never ended up being made. And the sketch stayed in my sketchbook for quite a long time. And every time someone came by that sketch in the sketchbook, they just asked, what is this? Not being an illustrator, uh, I didn't really know what it was. At the time, I been classically trained as a painter and a sculptor, so this was the very first illustration I really made. That first year I made it into Christmas presents like all artists do, and everybody loved them, so what are they? 
So I, they're big toe people. I grew up being a very blonde child and everybody said I was a toe head, which is T-O-W, not T-O-E. But even into my adult ages, even though I think I'm a smart person, I assumed they meant a big toe. I just didn't have anything um, to go on other than that. So I thought it was a big toe. So I was drawing these big toe characters and 610 illustrations later, I have a whole company based off of them. So the Absolute series references our Western iconography. This body of work started out as being an exploration between what is a symbol and what is the, the definition of our absolute philosophies. Something that's rigid, something that's unmovable, or something that's pure. And then I started to create my own language using that symbolism. So at 20-something paintings now, I've created my own language repurposing those symbols. Usually there's an idea of a pairing of a symbol and a pairing of a word. The absolute, let's say today I worked on the absolute opinion, and you kind of start from there. What do I want to say as a picture? What do I want to say as a painting? I do a bunch of sketches first before I start working into it, and then I reclaim lumber, and I have a whole library of wood that's been discarded, um, that I clean up, plane, sand down, make pretty again, and I select which piece of wood I want to use for each painting, and they become their own kind of character to in this in this play that I'm about to put on. And then I sand and plane and clean off the wood, and then sketch my original drawing back onto um, the piece of wood, and then they're painted in oil paint. We're at the Columbus Idea Foundry in their brand new location and I do a lot of my large scale work here. Uh, outside of my studio, this is my second studio. They are a community uh, makerspace. It's actually the largest makerspace in the world currently. And people from the community can come and rent out tool time to use whatever they want and become a member and use the space like it's their own. And you can go to events that they put on, take classes here, and also work from the space. I love finding old things and making them new uh, and bringing life back into something that looks aged and has character. I also feel very strongly that my work isn't fully done until it's in the hands of somebody else who's you know, purchased it or can appreciate it. So there's a full life cycle within my work. Um, the process itself is very hands-on and I'm kind of a hands-on kind of guy. And I tend to focus very heavily on getting something very smooth or very finely painted. Um, but that's just because that's the part that I really enjoy. Pilot Dogs has been a fixture in the Franklinton community since the 1950s. The nonprofit organization trains dogs to assist individuals with vision impairments, and each new puppy recruit starts rigorous training at about one year of age. Once the dogs successfully master their skills, they'll spend up to four weeks living together with their new companion at the Pilot Dogs facility, getting to know one another and learning each other's habits before starting out on their new journey together. Here's more. It started back in, just right after World War II, and that their uh, seeing eye developed that program. A gentleman that came back from the war 
lost his vision. Got involved with the government at that time of making it a law that the guide dogs should be have free access as a general public. It got started in a very unique way. It started with an individual that was legally blind from New Albany, Ohio, his name is Stanley Dorn. Stanley wanted to assist the blind community back then in 1947 and got his training and started the guide dog school. We've started in 1956. We built the building here on the corner of Grubb and Town. The neighborhoods really watched out for us and helped us. In this environment, in our facility, when the harness comes off, the dog is just a pet. People will hear about us from other people that they know who have pilot dogs, maybe a family member or friend or someone they you know, randomly run into, uh, or their blind services, their eye doctor, someone will mention us. We get our dogs when they're puppies. Um, some of them are from, we have a small breeding program of our own, and then the rest are from breeders, mostly in the Ohio area. We're an in-residence facility. So someone who has never had a guide is going to be here for a four-week training course with us. And it is very much like a dorm. When they get here, we first try and get them acquainted with the building because they're in a new space, so they have to learn it. The hallways, their path to their room, to where they're going to be eating, um, to the main kind of hangout room during the day, and where they're going to be taking the dog out to go to the bathroom and those types of things. So we want to get them comfortable in the building. And then they're going to start taking walks with the trainers. I have the best job in the world. I am a trainer instructor with Pilot Dogs, so um, I alternate. Uh, about 10 months out of the year, I am training dogs like Caesar. Um, getting them prepared from start to finish for everything they're going to need to know. And then a couple of times a year I'll split that and I will actually come in and instruct the visually impaired how to use the dogs that we've trained. So I get a little bit of both. I'm a dog trainer and a person trainer. After a few days of that, they are paired with a dog and their first experience with the dog is bathing them, which is... <laughs> quite a first experience with a dog. Not nearly all of them are really that excited about getting a bath. <laughs> the biggest things are keeping me safe on the sidewalk so he doesn't get to go off and sniff on the grass on either side because then I'm gonna trip and fall. Um, any trash cans, bicycles, anything, construction cones, anything in the way, he's trained to get me around it so that I never even know it was there. Hopefully it's just a smooth movement and I don't have to stop and find out what's going on and he's going to keep me from tripping, falling, running into, bumping into anything. They're taught how to handle a stop sign. The stop sign they can eliminate by most people stop at a stop sign and edge up right away. A stoplight they'll sit tight if they've got a red light. So they're waiting what we call the full cycle. So at a traffic light they stop at, they're listening to the idle traffic to their left or their right, they're parallel. And when they hear that acceleration, they can run we call that running interference, so that's safe to cross. There's no cost to the blind students who come here. We cover their round trip transportation, whether that's a plane ticket, a bus ticket, reimbursing someone for gas <laughs> for bringing them. Their stay here, which you know includes three meals a day. We have a cooking staff. We have everything, we try and have everything that they need here, sheets, towels, all of that. Um, and then the dog, the dog's equipment, which is its harness and its leash, those are all included. Aside from you know spending money that they might want to bring, there's no cost here for getting a dog. So the only cost we ask them to keep in mind is once they leave, the veterinary costs. There's cane travel and there's other avenues, but a lot of the students that decide to get a dog are very pleased that they have gotten a dog for companionship. And as some of them say, you know, I go with a work for a dog or walk, walk with a dog and I work with a cane nobody's ever told me I had a good looking cane. I actually always wanted to do this I you know I was a little kid I wanted to be a lion tamer and, and work with dolphins and all those exotic things 
Um, and I read a book actually about uh, a girl who lost her sight at 13, right when I was around that age, and it talked about everything about how her life changed and people treated her differently and the limitations she faced. And it went through going through Get a Guide Dog and how hard it was. And since I knew I wanted to work with animals, and then I saw the difference that you could make with animals, it was pretty much a matter of then growing up and getting to be exactly what I wanted to be. ColumbusArts.com is Central Ohio's most comprehensive source for arts and cultural events. Be sure to check it out to find great things happening around town this week. That's our show. To see more of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you at the ultimate intersection of arts and culture next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com.